Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on the IHI Call 8 on Modeling Regulatory Sandbox Mechanisms and Enabling Their Deployment to Support Breakthrough Innovations. My name is Sergio Martin, and I will be moderating this session today. Uh, first, um, I would like to let you know that we are recording this session and uh, the recording as well as the slides will be available in the IHI website. Uh, the call will be launched shortly and all the links and details on how to apply will be published on the IHI website and on the funding and tender portal. If you want to ask questions, please use the chat function on the right corner on your screen. Um, today we have Natalie Signoret, who is a senior scientific project uh, manager uh, on this topic and she's going to kick off with the presentation. We also have uh, Francois Evreux and, uh, from Roche and uh, Magdalini Pepadaki from MSD, who is going to present the topic itself. Um, as a legal officer, we have today with us Carolina. So without further ado, please, uh, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, it's important to remember that the webinars of today will cover the a bit of introduction on the IHI program, so the Innovative Health Initiative to understand the concept of the program to have the presentation on the topic and uh, we will have uh, so Francois and Magda presenting the, the topic that is proposed. We will come back to some um, uh, elements important for you to remember when putting together your proposal and uh, some important elements uh, that you need to be aware uh, regarding the evaluation and tips for writing a successful proposal. Now today we won't cover anything about the rules and the procedures since this has been already the subject of a separate webinar and we have including here the link of the presentation and the recording so please have a look at those if you have some specific issues about more specifically rules and procedures okay so just a couple of words to understand what is the Innovative Health Initiative. It's a EU partnership in health between the European Union, represented by the European Commission on one side, and the healthcare industry associations, represented by the association COSIR, which represent the medical imaging, radiotherapy, health ICT, and electronic medical industries. EFPR, including Vaccines Europe, that represent the pharmaceutical and vaccine industry, Europa Bio, that represent the biotechnology industry, and MedTech Europe, that represent the medical technology industry. So through this public-private partnership, oops, yes, through this uh, public-private partnership, we have ambitious objectives that are set in all legislations that are to turn health research and innovations into real benefit for patients and society, deliver safe, effective health innovations that cover the entire spectrum of care, meaning from prevention to diagnosis and treatment, particularly in areas where there is an unmet public health need, and makes, industry health indus makes Europe health industry globally competitive. Oops. Yes. yes. So our project, IHI project, are created via an open and competitive call for proposal. Now, this cross-sectoriality and public-private partnership are important to leverage the contribution from the industrial partners coming so from the IHI and industry associations, as I mentioned previously, COSIR, FPA, including Vaccines Europe, Europa Bio, and MedTech Europe, if relevant contributions from contributing partners that needs to be approved by your IHI governing board and public funding that comes from European Commission through the Horizon Europe program. Now we are working along our strategic and research and innovation agenda. This document that you have a link at the bottom of this slide um, reflect and put the focus on our partnership in cross-sectoral approach uh, to facilitate the creation of new products and services to prevent, intercept, diagnose, treat, and manage disease, and foster recovery more efficiently. So the goal is really to lay the foundations for development of safer, 
and more effective healthcare products or solutions that respond to unmet public health needs. And that can be implemented into healthcare system. However, of course, we have to remember that as a public-private partnership, the research supported by IHI remain at a pre-competitive level. Now here, for this particular topic that uh, will be subject to the upcoming call launch, is what we call a two-stage uh, call. So what is a two-stage call? Basically, we had um, a topics that have been worked out by a pre-identified industry consortium that has been uh, approved by your governing board as part of our, that will be approved by our governing board as part of our annual work plan. Now, as soon as the call is launched, we have what we call the stage one. So the this stage one allow the um, applicant consortium to form themselves and to submit a short proposal in response to the uh, to the, uh, the the call topic. Typically, in the applicant consortium, we have academics, hospitals, regulators, patient organization, small and medium sized enterprise, as well as for-profit entities with an annual turnover of less than 500 million euro. Of course, we don't necessarily have all of them, but we need to have um, the entities that are really needed in order to uh, achieve the objective of the topic. Oh, sorry. So once the, uh, the submission is done, we will do an evaluation and only the uh, top rank proposal will move to the second stage. In this second stage, so what we would say the winning applicant consortium will then merge with the pre-identified industry consortium that is listed under the call topic in order to create the full consortium and propose and develop the full proposal that will be submitted to IHI. This full proposal will be again reviewed by independent experts. And if everything goes well, then we will enter into the granting phase. And the granting phase means that we will work towards uh, the finalization of the grant agreement, which is between the project coordinator and the IHI GU. And we will sign this grant agreement and there will be on the top a consortium agreement, which is an, an agreement between all the different partners. So this is again in a nutshell to summarize the way the two-stage procedure works from the, the call launch to in order to have the project launch at a certain point of time. But again, if you want to see or to hear more, please refer to our specific webinar and the rule of procedure. This was just as a reminder how it works, but now we are going to move in actually the bulk and the content of this topic and I will leave uh, the uh, floor to Francois and Magda to present us this topic that we have in front of us. So please, Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nathalie, for the introduction. So good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure, together with Magda today, to present uh, the, the topic of modeling sandbox uh, mechanisms and enabling their deployment to support breakthrough innovation. And if you go to the next slide, please. So to kick us off, let's contextualize a bit the project uh, with this illustration that was built out of an horizon scanning exercise performed by the EMA, which identified 25 trends in innovation for the future. And this to say that in between the acceleration of science and technology on one hand, on the other hand, of the growing technology integration into healthcare innovation, research and development, but also thinking about new approaches to manufacturing, healthcare delivery, there are new paradigms that could emerge and challenge the current regulatory approaches. And this may require the adaptation of the development of new standards, new requirements, or even new approach to how do we make decision making. If you go to the next slide, please. And this is where comes in regulatory sandbox. So basically the regulatory sandbox made their apparition in the um, 
uh, draft proposals coming from the Fuller Commission on the revision of the EU general pharmaceutical legislation and present it as important future proofing elements in those draft proposals. But in a sense, regulatory sandbox is basically a regulatory tool which allows the testing of novel solution in a controlled environment for a limited amount of time under the regulatory supervision. This mechanism entails basically an objective for both innovators and regulators. For innovators, the objective is to get a path, but also to get regulatory certainty, which is critical. And for regulators, that the opportunity to understand better those new and disruptive uh, care solutions that are coming, understand them, and define how best to regulate them. On that basis, this whole experiment and that mechanisms helps to inform future regulation or update of regulation through experimentation and uh, evidence generation that can accompany it. So that minimizes the risk of regulating prematurely or inappropriately because you do that based on an informed experience. And that can also facilitate more efficient and rapid subsequent adaptation of the legislation. This is basically an adaptive tools. And the reason why is because you do not revise the legislations every other six months. You do revise legislations and typically these general pharmaceutical legislations every other 15 years. So we need to take that into account. One additional point I'd like to, to, to raise is I speak about uh, the revision of the general pharmaceutical legislation for which those provisions are being put on the table. Let's not forget that similar provisions for regulatory sandbox already exist into the Artificial Intelligence Act. And the reason why I mention it is because that provides a nice hook for those applicants who may consider case studies um, specifically at the interfacing between AI and medical device. So we need to think broadly and to encompass also those opportunities. Next slide, please. So even if regulatory sandbox exists elsewhere in the world, especially in other fields, um, the mechanisms uh, remain at the level of provisions and quite conceptual in the healthcare innovation space today. So translating the concept into an effective mechanism is not straightforward and comes with a number of questions. What's the um, diversity of possible healthcare innovation that could benefit from a sandbox? How do the nature of those innovations and their specific characteristics inform the construct of uh, the mechanisms, which feature of practices, ways of working should be built into the mechanisms of regulatory sandbox to make it effective. And regulatory approvals are not the end of the story and usually do not warranty the adoption of innovation. So how do regulatory sandbox connect with other stakeholders who have a role in the ecosystem beyond regulators and developers, thinking about health technology assessment bodies, payers, clinicians, patients, for example, to foster the uptake of those innovations which are being developed within a regulatory sandbox? So those are typically some of the questions we need to answer within or to address within the project. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, um, we see increasingly coming together a number of disciplines uh, in areas such as medical device, data, in vitro diagnostics, AI mentioned it before. Uh, you could think also about substance of human origins and that list is not exhaustive. But the message behind that is that there is always innovations which happen at the interface of those disciplines. And those disciplines are governed by different regulatory frameworks. So we do expect to see a number of regulatory challenges to arise at the interface of those framework that governs those disciplines and the innovation basically that arise from those intersections. And that's the reason why engagement across sectors and multidisciplinary collaboration are essential. We definitely need innovators from the academic sectors and from various developer organizations thinking about biotech and startups. 
this is about regulatory sandbox. So definitely regulators, whether they are from the uh, medical side or whether from the uh, medical device side as well, are more than welcome. They are essential and core to the project. And beyond that, even the regulatory science community. As I mentioned also earlier, uh, let's not forget about the rest of the ecosystem, downstream decision makers, payers, HTA bodies, and solution recipients, such as patients, healthcare professionals, clinicians, are also important in that journey, and we have also a role to play. Um, that diversity of stakeholders reflects the ecosystem, basically, and is essential to, uh, to ensure that there is um, an uptake of the innovation. And uh, the reason why we also all move stakeholders together around the table is to help to build trust into these uh, mechanisms we are trying to further advance and to also to uh, ensure trust into the future outputs of that mechanisms. Next slide, please. So this brings me to um, discuss a little bit the scope of that topic. So first of all, that project should be approached as a methodological simulation. And the overarching objective behind that is to make sure that we deliver a recommendation for the architecture of regulatory sandbox and operating principles features. And the focus remains essentially in the space of regulatory activities pertaining to healthcare innovation. So that's the essential focus. This being said, there is no pre-identified type of healthcare innovations. We will need in the project a diversity of cases to model appropriately and robustly the sandbox mechanisms, thinking about several scenarios if needed. As mentioned before, um, this will require from all stakeholders, even beyond the pure regulatory aspects, uh, and, and stakeholder will have a role on the regulatory focus. Beyond that, to cultivate a more progressive thinking to accompany also the final adoption of healthcare innovations, which are being evaluated or have been evaluated through regulatory sandbox. Next slide, please. In terms of activities, this means that there will be a need to perform a number of uh, research to identify those potential innovation case studies we can make use of. They can come from the past innovation that have made they, uh, their way through today, but could have benefited from a sandbox if that existed at, at the time. It can be present healthcare innovation case studies you may have already, but also they may come from the horizon scanning activities we will need to engage within the project. There will be also a number of activities to think through and anticipate the consequences uh, to develop such an innovation and the regulatory sandbox for developers, for regulators, for the other stakeholders mentioned around, and basically what does it mean? Um, what does it mean for all those stakeholders and how does that respond to, um, to making sure that we do whatever is needed to foster the uptake of those innovation? That means also that we'll be, there will be a need to identify proactively in the context of those reflections uh, any guardrails or mitigation measures. And thinking about developing the recommendation I evoked before, there will be also work to, um, to benchmark um, how do, what can we learn from the other regulatory sandbox that exists or existed around the world to learn from uh, the good practices, but also learn from what failed so we can contribute to identify conceptual elements, operations, ways of working, features we could take advantage of in that, in that project. And this should nurture uh, the modeling of how we do operationalize the sandbox. And by modeling, I mean the design of the sandbox architecture, but also making use of the identified case studies to run them through via simulation into that model to think about it and to reflect how the model we design is efficient or not and respond to the needs and whether we need to address it a little bit so to refine basically the recommendations. And I will stop at this stage and hand over to you, Magda, to continue. Thank you so much, Francois and team. Uh, can you let me know if uh, you hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, please move on to the next slide. 
Uh, picking up from uh, Francois, this is uh, quite the exciting um, uh, topic to, to develop as it entails a, a number of really creative approaches. Some of these we've highlighted on this slide, which is actually modeling what a novel framework in the context of a regulatory sandbox looks like. So we expect that uh, the proposal would include a general thinking along the lines of uh, operational uh, design, design thinking uh, and modeling on uh, how we should go about designing the regulatory sandboxes and evaluating perhaps a range of different models. Uh, we also expect that uh, the applicants and the overall proposal should be broad enough and open to consider additional enablers that may be needed for <clears throat> the implementation of the regulatory sandbox construct, meaning perhaps digital enablers, infrastructures or uh, tools. And hence, we welcome the applicants to be thoughtful and creative in that way as well. And uh, uh, third, thirdly, last but not least, it's also important to think holistically about the critical path of the life cycle of a given healthcare innovation and um, include uh, the full set of stages uh, across that critical path, as well as the relevant stakeholders. That being said, that uh, we expect that the consortium is going to have the shared objective to both develop the model of the regulatory sandbox as a key enabler of these uh, future-proofed regulatory uh, um, strategies, but also have enough detail and robustness about the approach to take to generate uh, important evidence that are needed and engagement with the necessary stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, across the, criti path, the critical path or the, the life cycle of a given healthcare innovation. <clears throat> uh, and uh, we uh, recommend as an important guidance towards that way to have a, um, a diligent and uh, thorough understanding and overview of the current regulatory fr frameworks in terms of their limiting aspects, as, also, as well as the flexibilities that uh, they would be offering and a regulatory sandbox contract, the con construct would require to enable the goal of, uh, of these projects, which is to um, uh, future-proof timely development and access of healthcare innovations. Next slide, please. So to summarize, the expected outcomes consist of a uh, horizon scanning exercise for potential candidates in the form of case studies uh, that would help us understand how sandboxes, the full potential of the sandboxes, and how they can actually provide a new, novel, and additional tool to complement the existing frameworks, address some of their limitations, and use these identified case studies to model this uh, new regulatory sandbox construct process. We expect that an analysis is going to take place on how the sandboxes dial up our ability to drive this science and health uh, technology innovation while the regulatory and legal landscape are still evolving. And uh, we expect, again, going back to my earlier point, recommendations for cross-stakeholder engagement and an end-to-end -end view of the operations that are needed across the critical path of a healthcare innovation to support both the developers but also other key actors uh, alongside the developers and the regulators depending on the nature and the maturity of the technology. Next slide please. So, uh, in terms of high-level impacts that we feel this project is going to unlock, of course, the readiness of our regulatory framework, but also uh, for the side of developers having greater readiness, predictive capacity, and proactive thinking in place to develop in a successful manner novel and transformative healthcare innovations. Uh, definitely and hopefully future-proofing the EU regulatory system. And as Francois mentioned, uh, the EU pharmaceutical legislation has 
uh, focused quite extensively on the potential and the opportunity of regulatory sandboxes in unlocking uh, our future proof mechanisms. And of course, be another area to enhance cooperation, collaboration, and partnership among different healthcare stakeholders, primarily developers and regulators. But as mentioned earlier, all the key actors that are um, important for the adoption of healthcare innovations from uh, health systems all the way to patients. Ultimately, we see this as a very important project, the outcomes of which and the success is going to help make Europe a more attractive and competitive destination for the development and adoption of healthcare innovations. Moving on to the next slide. You can see here an overview of the contributing companies with MSD and Roche, with myself and Francois co-leading, and of course under the auspices of um, FPIA. And we are hoping and expecting uh, the uh, successful applicants to have the following expertise and uh, um, areas of focus around healthcare innovation from R&D, uh, including, of course, manufacturing and CMC, clinical development, regulatory aspects with uh, accompanying legal and IP uh, elements, but also cover, be able to cover access, uh, not only around HTA uh, pricing, but overall engagement with the cycle of care, including medical health affairs and um, uh, communication pa patient engagement capabilities. We would like to uh, see skill sets around uh, clear decision making um, and uh, implementation um, approaches, including risk assessment, risk management expertise, especially given that the regulatory sandboxes are going to be an experimental um, construct and we need to ensure that safety and efficacy maintained uh, are continue to be um, safeguarded and part of the regulatory sandbox um, construct. As I explained earlier, it's important to have skill sets around organizational design, design thinking, around modeling a new um, evaluation framework, and uh, ability to identify, not exclusively of course, but identify um, cases and simulate uh, those, uh, um, uh, those identified uh, uh, case uh, examples. On the next slide, in more detail uh, for the applicants, some of the deep dives or the double clicks, if you will, based on the previous uh, pointers is including uh, expertise around, of course, very good project management, given the number of companies, but also the extent of the stakeholders that we expect uh, will have to be covered in this approach. A broad expertise in R&D around healthcare innovation, since there are no pre-identified um, case studies and they need to canvas and map with uh, us, of course, in the second stage. Uh, the broad range of uh, sectors and uh, fields, ability to simulate new operational models and have expertise around that level of organizational um, design. And uh, of course, strong regulatory and legal expertise, expertise, given that the primary focus of our work is to work with uh, regulators and um, enable the future proofing of uh, regulation. Being able to reach out, engage, and convey um, uh, perspectives from healthcare professionals as well as uh, patient associations and cover the cycle of care, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the space of access wherever HTA or other payer approaches are um, uh, relevant. Uh, dwelling a little bit on the point around uh, broad R&D expertise around healthcare innovation, this is really important in terms of enabling horizon scanning uh, capabilities, as well as a good understanding of the bottlenecks or the challenges that exist in the adoption of um, innovations in the uh, horizon scanning exercise. Uh, as well as, uh, of course, risk management and risk mitigation as plan of the organizational uh, design. And uh, as also mentioned earlier in the overview of our scope, be able to envision the digital infrastructures or systems and tools 
that may be needed to enable the regulatory sandboxes, hence IT and digital expertise. So, uh, as uh, uh, briefly mentioned, there are no um, pre-identified case studies at this stage. So, the expectation is for the applicants to propose indicatively some case studies, which are not going to be definitive, but at this stage be used as a good indicator of the uh, of the thinking and the direction uh, of the uh, applicant consortium. The um, final case studies will be, of course, uh, the subject of the research uh, once the final consortium has been um, uh, approved and uh, formed uh, and a, a part of the outcomes of the consortium as well. So just the indicative um, case studies for the application stage at this uh, at this phase. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, a, a little bit about the facts. So the maximum contribution from uh, IHI is uh, at uh, um, five million two hundred thousand, and is matched by uh, four million um, north of four million from the industry, um, uh, from the rest of us, the industry contributors at this at this stage, and there is an additional in-kind uh, financial uh, contribution that will be further refined at the next stage. Uh, it has been, however, uh, 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 for, this, uh, for this work. And as is the case with the majority of the IHI projects, the duration remains at 36 months and duration is at 36 months duration. On the next slide, please. I'm not sure. Do we have more or? OK, great. So um, this is uh, from my end in terms of covering some of the execution and application details. And uh, although we would be happy to support, please don't contact us, but contact uh, IHI directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois and uh, Magda, for this presentation. Maybe just I want to make clear because um, um, from the budget, if I come back to this uh, slide, um, the financial contribution is including, so it's not on the top of the 4,261,000, uh, et, et cetera. I just want to make sure that everybody understood that. And that, as we said, this allocation of this financial contribution will have to be agreed by the consortium, by the full consortium during the preparation of the full proposal. Um, before we move to the question and answer, and please, we see that you start uh, putting your your uh, question in the chat. I can only invite you to continue to do so. I will just briefly uh, touch upon the proposal submission and evaluation. But uh, so you still have time to think of your question to Francois and uh, Magda. While I'll continue to give you a little bit of information about the proposal template. Once we launch the call, we have all the elements and all the call documents that are available on the website to be looked at in terms of uh, submitting your proposal. And of course, it's, uh, it's as well in the funding on tenders portal. Now, there is a part A, which is basically the administrative data, and that's web form, and that's only directly uh, uh, filled in in the funding on uh, tenders portal. But then we do have a part B, which is more the narrative part, which include three sections. And actually, I will uh, answer already one question that came out through the chat. This uh, part B, so the template is uh, on the website, but we have three sections, excellence, impact, and implementation. Of course, at this stage, it's not the full implementation. It will be just an outline of the work plan. So we do not expect at this stage to see deliverables, but we need to see already what are the thoughts from the applicants around uh, the uh, structure of the work packages that could be uh, thought of. Now, we really ask you to read carefully the instruction in the proposal template. Why? Because we have the, some peculiarity, even if you can think that, oh, it looks very much like Horizon Europe, we do have some specificities related to the IHI program. 
So we can only encourage you to really read carefully this instruction because it gives you a lot of information on what we expect to see in the different section that really will be looked at by the evaluators when looking at the different proposals submitted. Finally, a specificity again on IHI, we do have an annex that is mandatory to be filled in about participant type. For the evaluation criteria, this mirrors exactly what we have in the uh, proposal template, meaning we have three evaluation criteria being on excellence, impact, and then I will move in the next slide on the implementation. The excellence is really about the uh, clarity pertinence of the project objective, the extent to which the proposed work is ambitious and goes beyond the stage of the art, and the soundness, of course, of the proposed methodology. In terms of impact, we look at the credibility of the uh, pathway to achieve the expected outcomes and impact specified in the work program, so in the topic text, and the likely scale and significance of the contribution due to the project. And then on the implementation, as we said, is that we won't have the full uh, description of the work plan, but we have already an outline. So we will ask our experts to look at the quality and the effectiveness of the outline and the capacity of the role of each uh, participants and the extent to which the consortium as a whole bring the necessary expertise that is needed to achieve the project objective. Obviously, uh, this is a short proposal, so uh, the narrative part is 20 pages uh, uh, long, uh, and um, this is uh, where, of course, it's always a little bit of challenge to put uh, uh, sufficient information for our experts to, uh, since this is the only document that they will have uh, in front of them to evaluate each of the proposals submitted and submitted, uh, sorry, evaluated against the topic text, which is the reference document that as a reminder for the moment is not yet officially launched, but will be as soon as the code launch, you will have the final text as well uh, published. Some tips for the applicants. What is very important and that we cannot uh, say enough, read all the code relevant material, especially the topic text. Form your consortium early and already think public private partnership. This is really important here in this case, as you have heard from Francois and from Magda, we have a number of uh, uh, companies already in the pre-identified industry consortium that have committed to this topic and have committed to contribute. But so in your proposal, think that at the second stage, they will join you in order to, uh, to work on the full proposal. Ensure that all the information requested in the call topic text and the proposal template is provided. And this really is to allow the evaluation uh, uh, for, for the expert to easily as, assess your proposal against the evaluation criteria. Uh, this is a given for this topic, but think already of the uh, plan and uh, uh, for potential regulatory impact of, uh, of uh, the results. And of course, here, uh, I think you have heard uh, sufficiently enough from this topic that this is definitely a regulatory uh, topic. But we want to flag that we have uh, produced a guide for applicants and project consortium regulatory consideration for AMI and IHR uh, project that provide useful advice on regulatory issues and how to interact as well with the regulators. And that can be useful to consider when you prepare your proposal. So have a look at that. You have the link here. Now, finding project partners. This is often the question that we get. Uh, obviously, uh, one way is already to network with the uh, contact on the participants of this call days, and uh, you know you have the, the link through the B2 Match uh, uh, platform, and I think Sergio will give a little bit more information in a minute. We have, of course, the uh, EU Funding and Tenders Portal Partner Search Tool that you can use. Of course, your the national uh, contact point, and uh, uh, here you have the list where you can find uh, national, uh, IHI national contact point. Of course, use your own as well network, but you can as well network through social media, and we have a tweet, oh, it's no longer Twitter, X, mm -hmm. X uh, that you can use, as well as the LinkedIn uh, that you can use, uh, and of course, your own, uh, your own network. And now I will give just about so you probably give start or at the end as you prefer, Sergio, or do 
no, we can um, already um, thank the, the panelists for their contribution to this session and encourage all the participants to put their questions on the chat yeah. box and we will be addressing them uh, very soon. Um, and in the meantime, I would like to promote our webinar of tomorrow, 21st June, and it will be about the patient-centered clinical study endpoints that are derived using digital health technologies. Um, and it will start at 3.30. So if you haven't um, added to your calendar, you can add it in the Bitumax platform. Um, and uh, also would like to um, tell you how to book your meetings via the B2Max platform, uh, which is easily done in four easy steps. So first you have to make yourself available. Uh, you have to look for partners on the participant tab, select the date, time and attendees up to eight per meeting, um, and then send the meeting request and wait for the reply. Um, so, without further ado, I think we can start already with the questions on yeah. the chat box. The first question is from Anneline Juncker. Will proposals uh, from devices also be considered? So, I, I don't know, Francois, if you want to take this question. Yeah, sure. Um, definitely, as I mentioned before, um, and speaking about the broad landscape of possible innovation and the fact. You, you can hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. And the fact that there is more and more device or integration in between device, drugs, and other elements, which I've mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, they are more than welcome. Obviously, the fact that uh, the sandbox provisions are in the GPL focus for now a, lot, a little bit of, um, of the applicants, at least from the industry consortium coming from the pharmaceutical world. But as I mentioned also before, um, there is a hook in the AI Act with provisions for the sandbox, which is a nice segue to invite those applicants who have a device, um, a new paradigm, innovative device, in vitro diagnostics considerations, or other tools like uh, digital health tools beyond just pharmaceuticals, uh, which can present a paradigm shift uh, and which are sufficiently disruptive to, to join the call. Definitely, this is open. We need to think broad, cross sectorial. Thank you, Francois. So the, the other question that we had, I think I addressed it already about uh, uh, whether we need to include, whether you need to include deliverables already uh, there. But uh, so as I said, there is already uh, elements to be included on the implementation, but it's, um, it's not about uh, deliverable at this stage. That will be in the second stage. Are there any pitching sessions for this uh, topic? No because uh, we have this opportunity through this webinar for you to ask questions, and then you have the be too much if you want to have this meeting and this uh, networking, but there is no pitching session here. Will the applications on their assessment um, reports made uh, public? No, we never release uh, the applications that are submitted, nor the assessment report that's remain confidential. But please, this is an opportunity to ask a question about the content. If you have any question about the understanding of the topic. So I think, uh, and we are grateful to have uh, both uh, Francois and Magda. So please take this opportunity if you have any question. We still have a bit of time uh, to put in the chat. Uh, when is the call most likely to be open, officially published? Very soon. Very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I think <laughs> stay tuned, <laughs> as we said. Uh, be on our uh, on our. Um, uh, newsletters, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, everywhere. You will uh, so that you won't miss the date when we start launching it. So so far, I cannot see any other question. Question. I think we have something more. Ah, something more are coming. So please again take the opportunity to put the question in the chat box, especially for or the Q and A box. Sorry especially if you have any question on the content on the topic, because as I said, this is the opportunity that we have both Francois and Magda to uh, clarify as needed or explain the topic. This is really the opportunity now. Uh, okay. yes. What is the expected date for the submission of the 
stage one proposals. I think it will be. But that will be mentioned as soon as, of yeah. course, uh, we publish uh, the uh, yeah. we we put the call together. All the dates will be clear by when we expect the submission of the short proposal. So as I said, stay tuned and uh, definitely look at uh, the final documents once they are uh, released. I'm sorry that there are many questions on How the- How many pages yes, on for the, stage two uh, full proposal? So the part B on the, for the two stages is 50 pages. And again, uh, there are plenty of uh, templates explaining, but that we will, uh, as soon as we have the, uh, the result for the stage one, we will uh, uh, contact the winning consortium and uh, explain all that together with the pre-identified industry consortium. But it's a 50 pages uh, long narrative. When is the call? I'm um, sorry, no, that one was addressed no, already. No, I think we have addressed all of them. But as I said, this, this, ah, yes, this one. So this is definitely a question for you, uh, uh, François and Magda. Are the various scenarios modeled within the same use case or are they linked to different use cases? François, do you want me to kick off and uh, you jump in? Yeah, please. Yeah. It is something that we have uh, debated with uh, Francois to some extent as well. Uh, it, uh, of course, the uh, what we want to avoid for uh, as a general direction is to have multiple takes on what a regulatory sandbox may look like, which are too technology uh, specific. So working across different case studies, we hope will give us enough of uh, an understanding of what can be absolutely generalized or standardized versus where some flexibility may be required because it's too specific to a certain technology. So uh, on that basis, um, we expect that the applicants can take a different approach based on their expertise around organizational design. Uh, but our direction and our expectation is to land on this um, degree of a, of a hybrid approach, if you will, where we have a robust enough understanding of the model as far as this can be standardized across different technologies. And of course, we expect that we will gain good understanding of how what may be needed for the different cases that we select, whether it's a digital thing or whether it's a, a new product, for example. Fr uh, Francois, would you like to add? Yeah, you, you submit, uh, submit um, uh, you explained that well, um, and maybe just had that um, if you think about there will be probably provisions uh, that will set in the end in the GPL and that will guide a number of things. However, there is a need out of those big provisions that outline the backbones of the intention and what is supposed to do and the mechanisms of the sandbox to go into the details. And that's where we say, uh, where we come in with that project to design really the architecture, the ways of working, the features, how the sandbox should work. And what we don't want to end up with is that there will be a galaxy of potential sandboxes. What we want to come up is with a set of recommendations that are applicable for any type of uh, that is generic for whatever sandbox is being established in the future, independently to a certain degree of the type of, uh, of healthcare innovation that will qualify for the establishment of a dedicated sandbox. This is essential, I think, to, to keep in mind. But definitively, this is also why we need to look into a series of um, potential cases, which are very different, potentially one from the other, because they will display different challenges for their development that we need to take into account that will reinforce the robustness of our recommendation. Thank you very much. Another question that we had is uh, anything about the TRL for the use case? Can you can you say that again? I'm sorry, the, the TR? TRL. But that technology the technology, the technology is, okay. yeah. But actually, in the topic text, we have not defined the TRL uh, for use cases. But if you want to comment on that, yeah. So we uh, again, we are leaving it quite open and uh, welcoming cases from the uh, entire spectrum of healthcare innovations, and. Um, 
as I think it's uh, it's mentioned, it was mentioned earlier by Francois, even for the space of um, digital artificial technologies, we welcome to leverage the openness and uh, and the hook that currently exists in regulation and have those examples as well. Uh, moving away from that, uh, again, we don't want to be normative. And as um, Francois was showing in the opening slide, it could be anything from a three printing technology, platform, preclinical technologies, to cell engine therapy, therapeutics, um, uh, in therapeutic innovations or more product uh, focused uh, examples. So we will have, that being said, we will ultimately have to prioritize, of course, and um, that is a matter of, uh, of discussion during the, the consortium, whether we want an example across all of these or whether we're going to focus on a few examples that are more therapeutic or more uh, digital. Uh, but for now, we would like to open it up and give people the opportunity to think uh, creatively, also considering which technologies could actually challenge or address the regulatory cons um, uh, the regulatory sandbox concept uh, more and and uh, help us and educate us that way whether these are more you know low hanging fruit or more challenging we really welcome the the thought leadership of the consortium there of the applicants thank you very much um so in the meantime i would like to encourage people uh, to go to b2max and use the uh platform just to network with the uh, possible um, consortium members. Uh, you can always go to Marketplace and search for project ideas. I'm sure there will be um, some of them there. And also, we would like to make a little announcement. The website of the IHI is uh, currently down, and we are working uh, to fix it. So we are aware of that, and we are really trying our best to um, have it back again. Um, so we will let you know all as well that um, everything is fine. I don't see any more questions on the chat. So can I bring an additional point to complement uh, the previous question? Uh, yes. Just to say that um, part of the activities, as, as we outlined also, is to perform within uh, the product itself an horizon scanning activity. And the objective of horizon scanning is not to be done for the beauty to, to do that, but to identify also in the future plausible development of innovation we could see in the short term, in the mid term. You need to think a little bit toward the horizon also. We, I, I mentioned during the presentation that we'll go to the past, to the present, but also to the future. That means that there won't be any technology limitation, but that needs to be plausible. The result of the reason scanning will also inform us and provide a spectrum of potential case that we need to estimate sufficiently plausible to come to integrate that thinking into the design. I hope that's uh, that's clear enough. Yeah, Fr Francois, and, and just to, it's a great point to raise and, and a good reminder. So just to, to raise that, uh, it's a good question asking about the uh, technology areas, uh, but we don't expect the um, consortium to, ha uh, to have uh, the, the full spectrum of case studies. A horizon scanning will continue to take place. It's part of the research and part of the outcomes. So just indicative uh, approaches that help us understand a little bit the thinking and the um, capabilities of the applicants. We're not expecting them to be to, to generate exhaustive um, uh, list of, uh, of case studies. This exercise will continue, as Francois said. So thank you, Francois, for reminding that point. Yes, and as mentioned in the, the topic text, is that of course uh, these uh, cases will be a bit decided by the full consortium, of yes. course, as uh, as the uh, added progresses. We still have a little bit of time in case you have a, a last minute question to our guest uh, Francois and uh, Magda. We don't seem to see anything coming. So I guess it's because it's perfectly clear. So that's great. <laughs> and we wish you all good luck. And uh, please stay tuned. As we said that uh, the uh, the call is imminent to be launched. So um, keep uh, track or uh, keep uh, 
when we have a, a working website, but uh, all the other tools in order to get uh, really the information and time and start networking if you are really interested by this topic to start really building your applicant consortium. And wishing you a very nice afternoon. I think we can uh, close this uh, webinar today. And uh, thank you very much. And goodbye. Thank you very much.